thank you for the organizers to invite me here today. I'm very pleased to uh, release this first uh, major report of IPES Food here today. Um, first, just a couple of words about IPES Food, which is a, an independent uh, panel of experts on sustainable food systems. And what it specifically aims at is bringing the issue of sustainable food systems at the level of decision makers. Uh, everybody at the high decision maker level talks about climate change. I think it's equally important to talk about sustainable food systems and that concept has to emerge. And what we mean by that is something that just doesn't only deal with the economic dimension but also is environmentally sustainable, provides for good health, is socially equitable and also takes into consideration the cultural dimensions. What the panel is doing is essentially taking this systems approach, integrating everything right from before production to after consumption, and uh, is taking a transdisciplinary approach, bringing in different types of knowledge, and taking a political economy lens on, on who decides what, who influences what, so that we understand where uh, actually leverage points are for change. Um, so the report uh, that I'm presenting today is uh, from university to, uh, Uniformity to Diversity, a paradigm shift from industrial agriculture to uh, diversified agroecological systems. And what this uh, report does is, is basically answering three questions what are the outcomes of both industrial agriculture and diversified agroecological systems? What is actually keeping the current systems still as the dominant system? And how can we balance, uh, how, how can we shift the balance and have that desirable evolution? I'm not going to spend much time on, on what is wrong with our current systems. We've heard a lot about that uh, by different speakers and I was very pleased to hear Alexander Müller speak before me because I think he very eloquently uh, described some of these uh, or most of these uh, problems. So I'm not going to dwell on that but rather focus on what diversified agroecological systems can actually bring in terms of productivity, environmental dimensions uh, and, and also from a health point of view. There are other aspects in the report that I don't have time to um, bring in here uh, today. But first, there's a, a, a lot of um, uh, talk about um, do alternative systems, are they able to uh, feed the world and, and, and are you able to produce in a sustainable way enough food? Uh, and I think there is a lot of misconceptions about that. Um, if you look at uh, recent studies that compare in one way, organic agriculture with conventional agriculture or diversified systems with uh, monocultures, there is a lot of evidence that actually there is a, a great potential in having the shift that we would like to see. First of all, in industrialized countries, unfortunately, most of the comparative studies have done on, been done on a relatively short period of time. And we know that for organic agriculture to uh, perform optimally, it takes several years after conversion to rebuild uh, soil health and, and the full performance capacity. So uh, the, the average of 166 studies that compared in industrialized countries, organic with conventional or industrial agriculture, have shown that organic performed about 8% less um, under the conditions that are, are not ideal. Uh, but the comparison of 133 studies in developing countries where you compare lower input, more traditional agriculture with uh, organic agriculture has shown that there's an increase of 80%. Now, if you convert the entire production of the world into organic agriculture and assume that in industrialized countries you will have 8% less and that in developing countries you would have these 80% more, you will actually produce 57% 50, more calories than what is actually available today. And we know that we are producing more than is needed because of the waste, etc. So uh, the, the question that can organic agriculture feed the world 
uh, of a world of nine or 10 billion people, the answer is very clearly yes. Uh, the similarly, uh, diversity plays an important role in uh, improving performance, especially in, in grassland systems where between uh, 13 and 79 percent productivity increases over the average of monocultures. But more recent studies that have been done over a longer time frame, uh, and I'm uh, illustrating here a 30-year study done by the Rodale Institute in the US, shows that on average, the performance of organic with conventional is actually equivalent. But in years of drought, uh, the organic production is 31% more. So have you, you have a much greater resilience and stability, plus the fact that you produce, in average, uh, the same amount. Now, the environmental outcomes are uh, neglected and, and overlooked, as Alexander said earlier. But uh, really, the fact that Diversified agroecological systems actually put carbon in the soil and can turn agriculture into a solution rather than being a problem. It can have a tremendous potential in restoring degraded land, and we know that 20% of the uh, land today is degraded, and improve various uh, ecosystem services, and I'm just mentioning uh, a few here. The uh, outcomes on, on biodiversity, which is a particular uh, interest here today, uh, are equally um, positive both by a diversification strategy and by, uh, by orga comparing organic with uh, conventional agriculture with greater uh, species diversity and also uh, greater uh, abundance uh, of uh, uh, organisms in uh, diversified or agroecological systems or organic systems being taken as a proxy for that. Now, if you combine all those uh, elements and look at the system, it really provides for virtuous cycles. Uh, the uh, different characteristics of what we define as diversified agroecological systems with uh, minimum or no use of chemical inputs, uh, minimal soil disturbance, the use of organic matter and soil coverage, the uh, combination of uh, livestock and crops or animal and, and, and plant species, and also the uh, intra and inter uh, specific diversity that provides for synergies uh, between them. They really end up with a number of outcomes that lead to the restoration of nutrient cycles, uh, high, uh, wa higher water retention, and therefore lower water use, uh, the uh, encouragement of natural pollination, uh, natural disease and pest control, which I haven't even mentioned here, uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions, the resilience uh, and stability of agroecological production systems, and finally, restoration of, of degraded land. And that in itself really reinforces uh, the cycle and the capacity uh, to uh, perform appropriately. Now, from a nutrition and health point of view, uh, the first point is that you don't have the negative impact of industrial agriculture relying on, on heavy use of pesticides and, and, and uh, antibiotic, preventive use of antibiotics in, in uh, animal production. Um, uh, it also provides for diverse, uh, healthy diets, especially where they are needed, i.e. where people are suffering from uh, various forms of malnutrition. And also, uh, several studies have shown uh, increased levels of beneficial either nutrients, in the case of uh, milk and, and meat, for example, with higher levels of omega-3 uh, fatty acids, or antioxidants uh, such as polyphenols uh, with a positive health uh, effect in, in plants. So the major question actually that the report was answering, how come and, and why do we not see a major transition towards diversified agroecological systems given the uh, expanding evidence that is now available that they can deliver on all the dimensions of sustainable food systems. And that brings us to, to that political economy analysis of why things are the way they are. And 
uh, we looked uh, in the report, we described seven, uh, sorry, eight what we call lock-ins, things that maintain the current predominant industrial model. And when I say the current industrial model, we know that in most developing countries, uh, that is not what is practiced. But when you see what the development uh, efforts are pushing towards, that is predominantly mimicking an industrial model and transferring it to developing countries. And, and so whether we are talking about what is already in place in industrialized countries or what is being pushed, uh, if I can use that term, on developing countries uh, in terms of model of agriculture, it is really that. And there are eight points that we identified that we call our lock-ins. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, to go in uh, detail through all of them, but we um, have already heard about the expectation of cheap food, uh, the export orientation. A lot of effort is going into uh, facilitating trade, and although we know that only 23% of food is, is traded across boundaries in the world, uh, it, the trade policies have a very strong influence on what is happening in, in uh, food production. Path dependency, when you've invested in a certain type of, of uh, model of agriculture, it's difficult to change. Uh, Short-term thinking, uh, whether you are uh, a, ministry, in a, in a minister uh, thinking about the next elections or in, in a traded company, uh, the bottom line uh, and, and your uh, return on investment is what matters. And the compartmentalized, uh, compartmentalized uh, thinking, uh, we've heard a lot already about the silos that exist and, and people just thinking about their own specialty. But I want to maybe highlight uh, just a few. One that has been mentioned already several times, including by Alexander, is the measures of success. If we don't change the way we judge the performance of our agricultural systems, it will be very difficult to change uh, to see a change happening, because what is measured today is really what industrial systems are good at producing. The second one is about uh, the, what we call feeding the world narrative. And we've heard, especially since the 2008 food price crisis, a lot of people saying in 2050 we'll have 9 or 10 billion people, we'll have to feed them, and that means we have to produce 60, 70, some even say 100% more food, and implying that that means we have to do more of the same and continue to uh, high input uh, industrial agriculture in order to feed these people. And I think that is certainly a very uh, wrong interpretation, first of the problem, and certainly second of the solution. And we'll come back to, to that. And the third one, which is really one that underpins and sustains all the other, is the issue of concentration of power. Who today really derives most benefits from the current systems we have? And when we look at uh, the market concentration in the major sectors that relate to food systems, whether it's the con commercial seed market, fertilizer sales, agro chemical markets, the uh, animal breeding uh, companies, or even grade uh, trade uh, companies, very few uh, firms hold the vast majority of the market in these uh, cases. And if you look at the retail, uh, the, uh, the retail side, you see exactly the same. A few uh, large companies are uh, dominating uh, the picture. Now, one thing that all these sectors have in common is they have a vested interest, and this is not even a judgment, uh, it's just a fact, they have a vested interest in maintaining the current agricultural system, which is the industrial system. Uh, if you advocate for less use of pesticide or fertilizer, that's not in the direct interest of those that are producing that. Uh, the trading, the, the grain traders want to see large quantities of uh, the major staples continue to be uh, the basis of, of international trade. And uh, the uh, distribution likes to have also uh, access to uniform uh, quantities of uh, major produce, especially for processed, as a basis for processed food. But 
I think things are changing, and uh, the message here is, is not a pessimistic message. I want to bring a very optimistic uh, message. Things are emerging, and there are possibilities to change things. And we've identified eight, what we call, emerging opportunities for a transition to diverse, diversified agroecological agro systems. I'm still struggling on that word. Um, first of all, there is the global recognition of the problem, and uh, in some cases of the potential solutions, and I'm starting with the, uh, just going back to 2005 and the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that clearly pointed to some of the problems of industrial agriculture, the uh, International Assessment on Agricultural Science and Technology for Development uh, that has been mentioned already a couple of times, uh, more recently, the first time that FAO talked about agroecology in 2014, in the symposium they organized, recognizing the potential of agroecology, and uh, even more recently, uh, a sustainable food system program that is being established as part of the 10-year uh, uh, framework program on sustainable consumption and production. At the uh, country or region level, uh, really encouraging changes in policies. Uh, I'm just giving a couple of examples here in Brazil and Cuba where really uh, policies have been uh, favoring uh, diversification, have been favoring agroecology, uh, and we heard from uh, our European colleague uh, the aspects that went into the last revision of the common agricultural policy. Far too timid yet, but a step in the right direction. A number of multi-stakeholder initiatives, and, and we know that if we want to tackle the uh, complexity of food systems, we need to have all the sectors and all the stakeholders involved uh, to tackle that coherently. And a number of uh, food policy councils at regional uh, or local level uh, that start looking at it in this uh, holistic way. Uh, the Joint Research Center of the European Union recently called for a more integrated approach between different sectors uh, to address sustainable food systems. In the Netherlands also there's been a, uh, an initiative. Um, integrated landscape thinking uh, is one way of approaching that and uh, the uh, um, Landscape for People, Food and Nature initiative uh, is, is one that is promoting that, promoting various integrated landscape management approaches that reconcile the uh, objectives of different sectors, agriculture, environment, tourism, etc. Uh, um, at the uh, university or education and research levels, a number of integrated uh, food system science uh, centers are being established that go beyond the traditional silos uh, and, and start thinking at it in a more integrated way. But maybe some of the most encouraging uh, aspect is the peer-to-peer the -peer action research uh, that is taking place on the ground, uh, Campesina, Campesina um, initiatives, etc. Um, and finally, on the consumer side, healthy eating and sustainable uh, sourcing is, is one important thing that is emerging and is, is really a potential reinforcing uh, way, as are uh, the closer link between producers and consumers through four, uh, short supply chains. Now, if you want to change uh, the system, we have to tackle those eight lock-ins in a comprehensive way, and we have identified seven recommendations in order to tackle these from different angles. And I will start with the first one, it, which is uh, what I already mentioned, the need to uh, look for ways to measure success differently, have different indicators. And moving between, uh, beyond GDP growth, as Alexander rightfully uh, mentioned also, or yield per hectare, uh, or productivity per worker, towards things that are really the desirable things that we want to see happening in terms of nutrient content or nutrient availability where it is needed. Uh, the uh, total production, not just of one major commodity, but the total production of the whole system, uh, resource efficiency, uh, ecosystem services, uh, and the livelihood resilience and uh, social equity that are uh, really neglected and overlooked so far. So the recommendations are to develop new, rec uh, new indicators of sustainable food systems, to shift support, including through subsidies, from what is now still in most cases acreage-based uh, 
to uh, supporting the shift towards diversified systems. And we know that the, the bottleneck is really the transition, which is a difficult period, which is, uh, cannot really happen easily without uh, specific support. Um, short circuits and alternative retail infrastructure, using public procurement as a motor, excuse me, as a motor to, uh, that's to wake up the people that have a <laughs> siesta problem. Um, uh, public procurement can be a motor to create uh, the, uh, the markets initially, to strengthen uh, social movements and, and uh, different constituencies to work around the uh, use of agroecology, to mainstream uh, agroecology in education and research, and also develop food planning processes. And, and we, one of the things that IPES Food is doing also is to start a, a campaign to move from a common agricultural policy in Europe towards a common food policy in uh, Europe. So what we'd like to see is, is really moving towards diversified agroecological system, whether we come from a, a highly uh, intensive industrial model of agriculture like we can see in uh, the US or, or uh, many uh, transition countries, or from subsistence agriculture, uh, both uh, will benefit from productivity uh, increases and stability and resilience and, and all the other benefits that I mentioned uh, from that evolution. So uh, just a couple of more words about the, the kind of key messages I want to leave behind. Of course, industrial agriculture has provided uh, the calories that we are producing today, but essentially to global food markets, not always accessible to for example, the 800 million people that are still hungry. And the problems that we have identified are specifically linked to the characteristics of industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture is locked in place by the uh, different um, vicious circles that I identified. And we know that tweaking the current systems by having uh, more environmentally friendly or applying a little bit less fertilizer and pesticides uh, or taking a little bit more attention to nutrient uh, content by biofortification or similar things is not going to provide a sustainable solution. We must really change uh, the basis. What is required is a fundamental different model of agriculture, which we call diversified agricultural systems. These systems can compete with industrial agriculture in terms of outputs, they perform particularly strongly under environmental stress. Change is already happening, and a series of modest steps in these different domains can really shift the balance and the center of gravity in food systems in the right direction. You will find the uh, report on the IPES Food uh, website, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>